Good evening, everyone. I am incredibly excited about tonight's agenda. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be a part of tonight's Hidden Truth series, and I find it a great pleasure and honor to be able to um, introduce you all to Dr. Allen. Um, Aaron Allen is an assistant professor of cultural studies. His personal and professional experiences have driven his research interests in the areas of critical race theory, critical university studies, and post-civil rights racial politics. With the support of family and colleagues, he was recently awarded the North Star Collective Fellowship, a reparative justice-based in initiative for BIPOC faculty created by Dr. Camille Gentles Pert and Dr. Tatiana Cruz with the support of the New England Board for Higher Education. As a recipient, Dr. Allen is hopeful for RWU's continued funding of this very important fellowship opportunity. He is also a passionate teacher whose students inspire him to create innovative courses. In this regard, he is indebted to the students who helped inspire his essay, Panther Pedagogy, Teaching Black Panther in the College Classroom which is part of a forthcoming edited collection tentatively titled Dreams of Wakanda, published by Penguin Random House. Before any of this, Dr. Allen is first and foremost a life partner to Jessica and father to Oakland, two beautiful humans who inspired this talk tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to our own Dr. Aaron Allen um, and Join me in applauding him as he comes to the Zoom stage. Thank you, Dr. Akumba Bay. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, also, thank you to the uh, organizers of the Hidden Truth series, um, Dr. Diamore, uh, Dr. Turner, um, and Dr. Jacobs. Uh, I really appreciate y'all um, inviting me to, to speak. Um, and thanks uh, for everybody showing up um, at 7 p.m. Um, to this event. So um, thank you. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen with y'all. Okay. Can I just get a, a thumbs up, Dr. Diamor, because I can see you? Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. So uh, the title of um, my talk is uh, Justice for Emmett, or more can be read as um, Just for Emmett. Um, so uh, this is a presentation about Emmett Till. Uh, but before I get into my talk, for transparency's sake and a bit of context, I want to admit up front uh, that the decision to present on Emmett for this series began more from a desire to take up the question of hidden truths than it was thinking about the relationship between race and place. In fact, my decision to present on Emmett comes from these nagging thoughts that were keeping me up one night. I had almost a compulsion to talk about them and it just so happened, I guess, that these thoughts overlap with the topic of hidden truths. But admittedly, the theme of race and place was less a part of this talk's inception. In fact, uh, my primary focus just on hidden truths was made even clearer when I received an email from the series coordinators asking me about uh, the proposal I had put together for this talk, um, specifically requesting if I could clarify in greater detail how this presentation would fit within the parameters of the series thematic focus on not just hidden truths, but also stories of race and place. In the same email, I was also asked by coordinators to adjust the title of this talk so they could better situate my presentation within the various approaches that other presenters have taken and are taking uh, to, these, uh, to this series theme. So in terms of the request to uh, adjusting the title, I graciously declined. Um, for me, it was a matter of striking a delicate balance between, on one hand, um, the political work of my title's purposeful simplicity, uh, justice for uh, Emmett, and again, or just for Emmett. Um, and on the other hand, clearly communicating how this talk fits within the colloquial thematic goals. While I prioritized the political work of my title um, by declining to change it um, for this presentation, I did accept the coordinator's 
uh, request to address how this presentation on Emmett Till would fit within the theme of race and place. And so I wanna open with some short comments on how I'm thinking about place. For me, um, considering Emmett and his story in the context of place, asks us, asks us to think about the concept in two overlapping ways. Um, so, um, the first is place uh, as physical location, right? Or more accurately, uh, the geographic environmental locales where we assign meaning. Here we might think about the question, where are you? Right? A question that relies on place, uh, sometimes problematically and sometimes not, to draw larger conclusion, conclusions about one's personality, temperament, feelings, attachments, or overall way of being. This is done because place in this regard references a site that accompanies broader social and cultural meanings. So it's within this register um, that I've been reflecting on the setting of Emmett's story. That is um, where a story takes place. The places we are compelled to go to understand his story. In some ways, this understanding affects the second way I'm thinking about place, which is the metaphysical positioning of something or someone uh, within our collective memory. By this, I mean the location where, let's say, th this something or someone tends to be situated within our minds in relation to other people, objects, events, attachments, or emotions. We can think of this process as inherently social uh, in the way that we collectively negotiate and sometimes struggle against where we choose to index or catalog or organize our thoughts generally um, or our memories of persons or events more specifically. So in this way, I've been interested in the place of Emmett's story within our shared memory. In other words, where his story is located within our collective and personal imagination of the past and where we locate him, cognitively speaking, um, in our present. Ultimately, it is within these two overlapping definitions that I've been reflecting on the places where Emmett Till and a story might find justice. But then again, um, I've also been considering, or maybe reckoning um, is a better way of putting it. I've also been reckoning uh, with the fact that maybe I'm not really thinking about justice for Emmett as much as I'm really thinking about uh, the places that are just for Emmett. Okay, so to get started, I first wanna provide a bit of background for those who don't know uh, the name Emmett Till or his story. Uh, to do so, it's perhaps best to begin with these harsh details about Emmett. He was a boy who would find um, his face scarred and legs severely weakened, his circulation cut off due to the constriction of his neck, wrist, and knee. His left wrist badly inflamed, but even worse was Emmett's right knee, so constricted, in fact, uh, that it grew to the size of an apple. Emmett was a boy introduced to the world with these injuries, all inflicted as a result of an obstetrician's forceps forcefully gripping his breech body in an effort to help his mother, Mamie Bradley, deliver him into the world on July 5th or 25th, 1941 in Chicago. Perhaps surviving such complications made Emmett a small miracle given the relatively high infant mortality rate for children in 1941, um, black children in particular. Emma wouldn't fully recover from the injuries inflicted from his birth until the age of two. In any case, this wouldn't be the only time Emmett's body would face serious injury as a boy. He was threatened with paralysis as a result of contracting polio at the age of six. While the disease failed to cause permanent damage to his limbs, uh, it did leave him with a speech impediment, a stutter. So I share these, uh, these uh, physical struggles because they help to contextualize Emmett as a person. That is to say, if we were to consider the only treatment for his polio um, was bed rest, this might help explain Emmett's restlessness growing up. Or if we were to consider that he came into the world exhausted, restricted as a result of being breached, this might help to explain why he was full of boundless energy uh, as his family would describe him. His mother, Mamie, has attempted uh, to help us with this task of placing his battle with polio and his birthing complications in context, pinpointing them as integral to Emmett's approach to life. She has shared with the world how these bodily afflictions shaped who he was. In a book written by Mamie, she observed that, and this is a quote, Emmett definitely had such a sense of urgency. He was 200% boy, 
It was as if he was trying to squeeze twice as much life into only a fraction of time. I should mention that this 200% boy, um, the boy we know is Emmett Till, was affectionately referred to as Bo uh, by his mother and grandmother, uh, Al McCarthy. So as the story goes, uh, while Mamie was still pregnant with Emmett, uh, a young family friend uh, used to bring gifts to her in preparation for Emmett's arrival, uh, saying they were for the little Bobo. And Bobo got shortened to Bo, and the name just stuck. It's like the mundane, innocuous moments where a decision uh, really isn't made or declared, but rather just gets seamlessly incorporated into your life. Like whatever the opposite of a watershed moment is. That's how this 200% boy became known to those who loved him most as Bo. And so throughout this talk, you'll hear me oscillate between both names. Uh, sometimes I'll use Emmett and sometimes uh, I'll use Bo. Now, uh, most who are familiar with Emmett's story, think of him as a boy from Chicago, but his roots really lay just over 10 miles west in the city of Summit. And even then, when Mamie took Bo home from the hospital, she brought him to their apartment at 7526 64th Street, uh, placing them at the so uh, southern end of town, an area of the city that locals nicknamed Argo, uh, termed after the 30-acre Argo Corn Products Refining Company plant, which lay at Summit's most southwestern edge. The plant served as the engine of the community, from employing most of its residents to stocking their cupboards with its products, like starch for clothes, corn oil, syrup, sugar, and cornstarch. So these latter two items, sugar and cornstarch, uh, were the two ingredients that probably excited Emmett most, as it meant the possibility that his grandmother, or um, Mamu, as he called her, would make her most famous lemon meringue pie. I like to think that if Argo cornstarch served as one of the important ingredients that made Emmett and his family's life literally sweeter, uh, then Argo as a town helps make it figuratively so. Emmett's family, like many of its black residents, often referred to Argo as Little Mississippi as a result of settling there after migrating from the actual Southern state. Because of this, we might think of, or we might think to focus on Argo as a place of refuge. Uh, as a site of escape from the racial precarity of the South, but that would only be capturing half the truth, one that misses what pulled Emmett's family there, the sweetness of community and its fresh baked opportunities. Mamie has told us about this nice slice of life that Argo offered her family, particularly her son Bo, saying, quote, for us, it meant the joy of, of the familiar, of family and friends, and of course, runaway ambition, end quote. Basically, all of the sweetest ingredients which made Argo for Emmett the place he'd know best and also the place that gave him the life he'd know best how to live. The loving, safe environment that Argo provided for Emmett is so meaningful to his story because it serves as a fulfilling backdrop to the not so sweet. And here I'm referring to the times when Mamu couldn't bake her lemon meringue pie because she ran out of cornstarch, which meant he had to either wait for Mamie's next trip to the market down on Archer Street, which was Argo's main thoroughfare, or at least for Mamu to borrow some from a neighbor, which was not any trouble seeing how the whole neighborhood was like an extended family. But even in times without pie, Mamu would at least throw together some jello for Emmett, which she, which he also loved. Actually, according to Mamie, Emmett spoke his first word at 11 months, and that word was, well, jello. As soon as he uttered the word, Mamie and Mamu looked at each other in elation, got a spoon, and immediately offered him a small cube. It was from then on he loved it. All this to say, for Emmett, even the not-so-sweet times were sweet in Argo. So perhaps that's why even after moving to Chicago in 1951, after a short stint in Detroit, he would return again and again to Argo on the weekends. You see, Bo was the type of kid with an independent spirit. And so nothing would keep him from the community he loved. As early as 10 years old, he would hop on a streetcar and take an hour long trip from their family's new two flat building on 6427 South Lawrence Avenue back to Argo. He loved Argo and Argo certainly loved him back. So this made it only natural that his first childhood romance would blossom with a girl from the community when he was 11. And boy, she must have been worth the trip. You see, Bo was never reluctant to try and impress. So he painstakingly thought about where he might take this unnamed girl 
but wherever it was going to be, it was going to be in the city. Never mind that this would mean he would have to take the hour streetcar ride to Argo and then back into Chicago for the date, only to then drop her back home and finally return back to the city before nightfall. Bo was determined and so it would be done. Now, if it was warmer, he might have decided to take her to the Brookfield Zoo. Back when Bo was just a toddler, maybe a mamu would strap him in his stroller and push him right along to the polar bear exhibit. He absolutely loved watching them dive into the water. And so we thought maybe his date might get a thrill out of it too. But this first date was taking place in mid-April and the weather wasn't quite cooperating yet. His next idea was better anyway. He decided he would take his date to what his mom believed to be one of the most beautiful theaters in Chicago, the Southtown Theater near Halstead Street. He knew that since they both were under the age of 12, he'd be able to get two tickets to the movies for 25 cents each. So the day of the date, Bo surely looked handsome. He was a very fashionable kid. In preparation, he likely got a fresh haircut at Polk's Barbershop on 65th and, and Cottage Grove before trekking to Argo. Once there, we might wonder whether Emmett, after first laying eyes on his crush, couldn't help but let out a quiet whistle as he approached. To help, Mamie had offered a potential solution. Um, she said to Bo one day, if you find yourself stuck on a word, take in a, a breath, whistle, and then go ahead and speak. Okay. Um, she went on to mention that, and this is a quote, when he whistled, it was almost a hypnotic cue that would calm him, steady his breathing, and allow him to finish saying what he had, to, what he had started to say, end quote. This being his first date, some butterflies in his stomach were sure to be there, and he certainly didn't want to, uh, the stammer um, to happen throughout the long ride into Chicago, and so maybe a small whistle to ease the flow of his speech. In any case, when they arrived to the theater, they approached the box office, possibly purchasing two tickets to the recently released musical Singing in the Rain, starring Gene Kelly and Debbie Reynolds. With $5 in his pocket, Emma goes to purchase two tickets, but runs into a bit of a problem. Emmett was big for a size, leading the box office to tend to believe that neither he nor his date were under 12. The 50 cent cost he anticipated for admission turned into $2, a dollar a piece. While Bo liked science in school, sometimes he needed extra help with his math. But that day, he didn't need anyone's help to know there wasn't enough money in his pocket for two tickets, plus concessions, plus the fare to take her back home. Bo recognized what he was forced to do. As he turned to his potential love, he had already begun to feel his tongue twist. So he paused, tried again, tripped up again. He quietly whistled, gathered a speech, then politely invited his date to pay for her own ticket. Once he finally uttered it, perhaps he found the request reasonable enough. After all, once inside the theater, he paid for the soda pop and popcorn. His date may have felt differently, however. When they finally arrived back in Argo, Bo and his date only exchanged a single word to one another to wrap up their rendezvous. They each said bye. Bo hopped back on the streetcar and headed eastbound on 63rd Street back to Chicago. And so um, that's just a bit about Emmett. If I can now shift gears um, and discuss when Emmett would become um, a national icon. So, um, by icon, I mean when he essentially transformed um, either into comedic icon Dean Martin or Jerry Lewis by memorizing their routines and impersonating them to his friends and family in Chicago just to get a laugh. You see, despite frequently spending time in Argo, Chicago afforded him and other adventures. In fact, he had quite the crew in the city. It consisted of his closest cousin, Wheeler Parker, and then there were Wheeler's brothers, William and Milton. Also, Bo would hang out with his cousin Crosby Smith, who everybody called Sonny. And of course, there was Emmett's pet golden retriever, Mike. They were all thick as thieves. Anyway, Bo loved being the center of attention. So he got a kick out of being the only one in the group with a television. What he'd do was watch skits and sketches from those music comedy variety shows like the Colgate Comedy Hour, and then perform them for Wheeler and the gang. Entire routines. He'd pretend to be Martin or Lewis or sometimes comedy duo Abbott and Costello. You see, Bo was a huge baseball fan. He'd go out to Sox Park Sundays in June. 
he used to like to get to the, get into the upper bleachers and yell his head off. Anyway, being the baseball fan he was, Emmett was liable to break out into Abbott and Costello's signature routine, who's on first, impersonating both Abbott and Costello's part. He would have his whole crew of cousins cracking up, but his absolute favorite was Chicago native comedian, George Goble. Bo would just occasionally yell out one of Goble's signature catchphrases. Well, I'll be a dirty bird, or you can't hardly get them like that no more. Although Bo's impersonations of Goebel were probably slightly off, uh, he was much too energetic to match Goebel's more like low key style of comedic delivery, but it never stopped him. He loved telling jokes so much so that on the weekends he trekked back to Miss Haynes store in Argo to buy them. He would pay a quarter, half a dollar, and even up to a dollar for them and bring them back to Chicago to tell his friends. And so just to give you a sense of, um, some of the like routines that Emmett would be uh, impersonating, uh, particularly in my mind, uh, you know, the who's on first. This is, uh, you know, the routines that he was watching. How do you, how do you like my wall club, Lou? Hey, all those people going to be at the game today? Certainly. Oh, this is going to be a whopper of a game. Well, it should be. Hey, yeah, but what? I understand they made you the manager this year of baseball team. Why not? So you're the manager. I'm the manager. Well, you know, I'd like to know some of the guys' names on the team, so when I meet them on the street or in the ballpark, I'll be able to say hello to those people. Why, sure, I'll introduce you to the boys. They give them funny names, though, Lou. Oh, I know they get those ball players off of funny names. Let's see, on the team we have uh, who's on first, What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You the manager? Yes. You know the guy's name? I should. Well, then tell me the guy's name. I say who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. You the manager? And then go yes. You know the guy's name? I'm telling you their name. Well, who's on first? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? The guy on first. Who is on first? What are you asking me for? I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm telling you. You ain't telling me nothing. I'm asking you who's on first. That's it. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy at first base. That's his name. That's whose name? Yeah. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who is on first? What are you asking me? <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, so when Emmett was impersonating these comedians or telling jokes, he would try to play pranks, but they weren't always funny and in fact could have gotten his friends in a bit of trouble. Wheeler has said, and this is a quote, what he thought was funny wasn't funny all the time, end quote. For instance, Wheeler recalled a time when he, uh, Emmett and Sonny were in Chicago and Bo yells out, I got two big cousins and nobody can beat them up. Wheeler and others weren't happy at all. They knew the gangs were really bad in Chicago at the time. And so Sonny and Willard looked at each other as if to say, like, why'd you say that? They knew Bo didn't mean any harm by it. He was just, you know, a fun loving prankster. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the story of an early morning kidnapping um, of Emmett or a series of kidnappings, I should say. As Mamie has told it, when Emmett was about two years old, his older cousins would arrive at their house in Argo on Saturday mornings to steal him away, sometimes as early as 5 a.m. She recalls it almost being like a competition. She said, quote, whoever got to our place first on Saturdays always seemed overjoyed to get to spend time with my baby, end quote. His cousins would take Emmett on these little adventures. In fact, it was these escapades with his older cousins that introduced Bo to what would become a place he absolutely adored, Riverview Park in Chicago over on 3300 30, Northwestern Ave. So Riverview wasn't just uh, any park. At the time, it was among the best amusement parks in the country, if not the world, and claimed to be the largest. Opening in 1904 and sitting on 74 acres, Riverview would eventually become host to some of the best attractions around. Walt Disney was even a visitor to the park, and it's been speculated that Riverview offered aesthetic inspiration uh, for what would become Disneyland in Southern California. Anyway, Bo's cousin would pick him up in their parents' Cadillac and head northeast for the short 20 mile journey. Upon their arrival, his cousins always noticed a three-year-old Bo's excitement to start to overflow once they came into view of the park's main entrance with a big sign just left, uh, left displaying the park's slogan, laugh your troubles away. Once inside the park, Bo generally insisted on one thing and one thing only. They go directly to the merry-go-round. The carousel to which Bo was referring was a beautiful ride built in 1908 with 60 lovingly hand-carved horses and several chariot-style seats carved with cherubs. The entire carousel was illuminated with old-fashioned carnival lights, 
and allowed or uh, and bellowed whimsical tunes as passengers enjoyed the slow moving circular ride. While his cousins always tried coaxing little Emmett onto one of the benches so they could sit with him, Bo insisted that he be placed on a horse. And it better not have been one of those horses that stood still, but the ones that gently like rose up and down once the merry-go-round got going. Oh, and he'd just be beaming with a smile, although the ride was less fun for his cousins as they would have to just stand beside young Emmett the entire time to ensure he wouldn't lose his balance and fall off. And let me tell you that that task became tiresome because Bo wanted to ride that carousel all day long and would have if his cousins let him. Often, the only way they could entice him from pleading for another ride was with treats. And there were tons of treats to be had. They would give him caramel corn, popcorn, cotton candy, hot dogs, and anything else they could stuff the poor kid. Mamie used to get so frustrated after Bo was brought home from the park filled with junk food. According to her, quote, they were making more work for the rest of us who had to take care of Bo after they dropped him off, bathing him, calming him down, and then putting him into bed, end quote. For Bo, however, it was all worth it. These rides on the carousel would bring joy to his heart, even as he grew older. Riverview was more than a place of nostalgia, though. It was a fixture of Bo's boyhood. He would return again and again at least enough times to brag about the park to his cousins from down south in Mississippi. His cousin Simeon couldn't believe just how big Emmett made the park scene. Being the jokester Emmett was, it wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibility that he might have embellished a little. Except during a trip to Chicago to visit Emmett and the rest of the family, Simeon had to admit Emmett was right. Not just about the park size, but all of it. Years later, Simeon reminisced about visiting Riverview, recalling that Quote, when I saw it for the first time, you just couldn't explain it, how beautiful it was, end quote. Perhaps the best sign that Emmett was not exaggerating about Riverview's magnificence was that it left so much of an impression on Simeon that he admitted to crying at the news of the park's permanent closure in 1967. But in the 1950s, it was all about the laughs and adventures at Riverview. And so, Emmett would certainly seek these adventures. He absolutely loved roller coasters, especially Riverview's renowned thrill ride, the Bob's roller coaster. You might imagine how Bob's sense of adventure would carry him to the Bob's first car. Sure, the roller coaster was slow going at first, and then riders would begin to hear the ratchets clanking, ascending them toward the coaster's peak. And once there, the Bob's slight pause allowed Bo to take full advantage of sitting at the front. It was that slight pause at the coaster's crest that allowed Bo's body just enough time to lean slightly forward and his eyes to first peer outward to get an aerial view of the tops of the trees lining the beautiful park, and second to take a quick glance down at the track to deep slope. Then, before he knew it, the feeling of weightlessness would take over Bo's body. As the bobs plunged, Emmett's stomach dropped almost as fast as the coaster only then for the bobs to reverse directions by banking upward and then to the left. From there, the coaster aggressively jerked Emmett's body in every which direction for just over a minute. Journalist and longtime Riverview Park guest Dolores Howe reminisced about how the bobs gifted riders, quote, a feeling of imminent collision and death, which made the ride more exciting, end quote. No doubt Emmett would agree. Just above the rattling sounds of the wooden coaster, you could hear both screams. Screams that must have sounded something like a mixture of joy and terror. His cheeks sore from laughing at the fluttery feeling of each dip. His forearms sore from firmly grasping the safety bar strewn across his lap, just so he could endure what had been described as a brutally traditional rough wooden coaster. If Riverview was the place to laugh your troubles away, Emmett taking on the bobs and the park's other roller coasters was a reminder that you could scream these troubles away too. And so, uh, if you want to get sort of like a, 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 a point of view style look at what it would have been like to sit in the first cars, I'm sure Emmett did, um, there's a video of, of the Bob's roller coaster. So they buy two tickets. As I understand it, the Bob's start off slow, deceptively slow. You kind of meander around a bender too. Then 
see the first real peak. You're still crawling as you move up the peak. You can hear the ratchets as the chain lifts you up. Keith leaned forward a little to see what was ahead. This was ahead. Now, some of you might wonder how the Bob's Coaster is significant to Emmett's story, especially among those who are unfamiliar with it. For me, uh, the Bob's brutal structural design and its violent twists and turns reveals just how exhilarating this roller coaster must have been for Emmett. More than that, though, it offers further insight into what would bring Emmett back to Riverview time and time again. The numerous rides in the park, uh, from the thrilling to the kitty, were not just an emotional experience for him. They gave him a bodily experience as well, one that was brutally fun. The type of fun that made Emmett, like Mamie said, a 200% boy. Okay, so um, I ask that you please forgive uh, this like inelegant closing. And to be honest, um, I wasn't really sure uh, how to end uh, the talk tonight. I mean, I think it'd be a crime to close without mentioning that Emmett, uh, Emmett Till, this boy from Argo, um, with roots laid in Chicago, uh, was an avid fisherman, uh, that he loved cooking. Uh, pork chops and peppercorn uh, was his specialty. Uh, that he assumed responsibility around the house, um, swept the floors, even though he swept a lot of that dirt under the rug instead of putting it in the trash. Uh, that he knew how to find odd jobs, uh, like taking orders for the ice delivery man for a quarter of pot. I mean, I guess it'd also be a crime not to mention that Emmett hoped to use the money from these odd jobs to buy a motorbike. And well, it was more like a, like a bike with, a, with an engine on it. And maybe he thought it'd be a crime to allow him to buy that bike, by the way, um, so he wouldn't. But yeah, um, I'm not sure how to close other than to say that these are just some stories about Bo, about Emmett. And I suppose we can talk um, a lot more about them. Um, so thanks for listening. And uh, now before taking your questions and comments to which uh, Dr. Diamore uh, will moderate, I'd first like to hear from y'all. And so if some folks wouldn't mind sharing, and then you can either put it in the chat or um, speak directly. I'm interested in knowing um, as you were listening, what were some of your thoughts and feelings? Um, and were there any ideas or sentiments that were invoked for you when you were hearing some of these stories? And so I figured we can maybe start the conversation there. So thank you. So yeah, so like if you can just go ahead and um, jump in before um, I, I allow, graciously allow Dr. Diamore to, to uh, start moderating. Oh, his relationship with, um, so the comment I'm reading is I love hearing about Emmett's relationship uh, with the sugar factory in, it, in his town. So Argo Corn Products. Um, so, I mean, I guess I, I'll, I'll speak to that is, um, yeah, so so like for, for me in terms of that story, uh, oftentimes like when I was hearing about Emmett Till as like being a, a Chicago boy, I thought that it, it really, um, sort of didn't fully capture, I think, what Mamie, his mother, painted in terms of like what their hometown was. And so for me, I was really trying to get us to, or at least for me, get me to think about um, what it must have been like to live next to Argo factory, right? And so how that might have impacted, you know, their everyday life or 
the things that they ate or the thing, you know, just like the sort of quotidian or everyday, um, you know, aspects of living in a town that is sort of, um, you know, generated by like this factory, right? Like this factory was the hub and the, like I say, like the engine of the community. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, thanks, Stephanie. So, um, I guess I, I'm I'm like pausing in in terms of like trying to think about like uh, sharing like the impetus for for the, this project a little bit more about it. Um, and so, but yes, so I, I will say that uh, celebrating um, joy was really important for me personally in thinking about um, Emmett and being really intentional and in, in thinking about like what it would mean for me to like fully take that on, like, like, full, like full board um, and be consumed in it. Um, and so for me, like, like writing the project was fun for me. Um, and I want, and that's all I wanted it to, to, to be. And so, yeah, like, like yeah. yeah. I don't know if you can see, but Nikki Ewan has a hand up. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Hi, Dr. Allen, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, thank you so much for this incredible presentation. Uh, you turned, for me, the very limited slice of history that I know of Emmett Till on its head and reminded me of like a broad picture of a human that we haven't been offered as much in the, the history since he was lynched, and I, I'm, 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 I don't have words actually. That's why I've been struggling so long for what to say. But I want to say thank you for the beautiful presentation, and say that the only things that I've known about Emmett were a portrait painted by a white artist that then wound up in a museum, and obviously caused a big struggle and problem, and. I think there's so many ways that we haven't looked at the fullness of this beautiful human's life. And I just wanna thank you for that. And it is gonna help me look at the ways that I decolonize history in so many more diverse ways now. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also um, want to note that that today is the Emmett Till, the Senate passed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act mm -hmm. just today, which is extraordinarily late and extraordinarily timely for your talk. So thank you also for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm a little, I'm a little conflicted on how to, um, I feel a little hamstrung, uh, if I'm to be quite honest, in how to engage with folks. Um, with this project, um, because uh, for for full transparency, what I was what I, what I was really trying to do was I I was really trying to ask myself is that like well, what does it mean to talk about Emmett Till, um, and not talk about what 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 we know, what we know his name for, and what does it mean to um, um, spend 30 minutes, 30 minutes um, minimum 
without without that. Um, and you know, I had asked some of my students, you know, if they've ever heard of the name Emmett Till before, and um, you know, a few of them said that they hadn't, you know. And so, you know, I I especially invited them to 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 come, and you know, initially I was a little, you know, uh, I had to like think about like, okay, so if they don't know and I don't include that, you know what are the politics of that omission? And, and, and then I thought to myself, you know, for students who've never heard of Emmett Till, they get to have like an experience and an introduction to Emmett Till that many of us don't have and are robbed of. And, and that for me, that then Emmett is robbed of. And so I wanted to try to create, um, just like a moment um and i wanted to stretch stretch that moment as long as i could be and not for any other reason than just to like um enjoy the stories so um yeah i'll say that i'll just stop there and let i think there's another hand up I cannot thank you enough for the experience. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Ewan. Hi. So I was going, so I was listening to you give this talk, and it's almost as if I have a split image in my mind. Um, you know, on the one hand, I'm hearing your um, narrative about him as a child, as a, you know, young person growing up. And of course, the other split image is of the event, you know, of the horror that was done to him and to his mother. And so I'm kind of wondering, so when you were doing this project, I imagine, well, I let me not say that I imagine, let me ask you the question. Sure. How much were you haunted by that? And what was your process of actually being able to let go of what we know as the overwhelming images and the overwhelming uh, knowledge of what was done to him. How were you able to kind of break away from that? Or were you able, uh, did you break away from that in order to do this, you know, recover his life, reconstruct his life for us as, the person he was, because the person he was is not the person we know, as you know. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. that's why you did the project. So, um, you know, I was mm -hmm. listening to you talk and I was just thinking, how, how did you, like, what was that like for you? Um, initially, it was quite difficult. Um, it, it, in a lot of ways, um, so uh, a large part of it is is in terms of, of, of the, the information is from uh, uh, Mamie's book on Emmett Till, The Death of Innocence. And so she shares, so half the book is about him. Mm -hmm. And so then what I had to do was then like stitch together afterwards, like them into like full stories and imagine myself there when, when, when Mamie wasn't. And, in order to do that, that required a little bit more research. And so outside of like that book, it then became like a needle in a haystack project. So what was that like? Initially, it, it was really tough because then it's, it's, it's tr like, like mining through so much of, of racial terror and racial violence. Mm -hmm. But as I got more and more information, mm -hmm. just like these little pieces, and I started stitching them together, then I be then I was fully immersed in in, in Emmett as this boy mm -hmm. that I was able to to go long stretches and not think about it at all, and you know I would share with my partner just these random stories, you know. Um, about you know his cousin Simeon coming up um, to Chicago and him recalling how you know 
that they needed to take a nap in the middle of the day. And, and he found that strange that, that that's what you do in the North, you, you take a nap. That's not something you do in the South. And I, it was just a small observation and I was laughing with my partner about it. And I, I saw so I, when I went, so it became when I was doing the project that his lynching, I didn't even, it wouldn't, it was, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking about just like what is like the pleasure of like this first date like and, yeah. and really reconstructing it and so I could say that as I was doing the project it didn't just change the narrative for me I think it changed me in the way I like am oriented to Emmett and so to, to the point where like I, I, I really feel and it was really important for me to recognize Emmett's humanity mm -hmm. because he was human. Right. Not recognize Emmett's humanity because he's a victim of racial terror. Totally, right. And, and I've been thinking a lot about that and, you know, I'm using this talk in the process of this talk to, yeah. to write uh, an article about this process and, and what it meant to me to, to give this this talk. And um, in the process of it, I had written down this 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 thing that is sort of like a guide about 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 black life and about black joy. And I, mm. and so I had I said I said, do our truths only matter due to the political significance of them being hidden? Or can they matter because they're just true? Like, like, like true in the way that a boy loves a roller coaster, true in the way that a son loves a mother, like in, in that just be it. Not for a, a, a political project, but just cause it's true. Right, right, right. But that's, that's something important to think about, yeah. 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 Thank you for your question. Thank you for addressing it. Yeah. All right. Um, are we good to go into a Q&A, do you think, Dr. Allen? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, sure. All right. So we do have one question in the chat, mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. folks should feel free to add theirs as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Alisa Miller asks, um, his mother tried to shape the memory of Emmett mm -hmm. by having an open casket. What do you think the impact of her decision was? And do you think it contributed to the kind of obscuring that you've discussed? Um, so the first part of your question, what do I think the impact of her decision was? I think that her impact of her decision was 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 powerful, right? Like like it 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 is often cited as like the marker or the start of right the the civil rights movement, right? So I mean, which is now part of like the the popular discussion. You know, ABC has the show, you know, Women of the Movement. As a, as a sort of like an anthology series, and they start um, with which her last name is Till Mobley, so maybe Till Mobley. She changes it when she gets married to 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 um, to Jean Mobley, um, and so I, it, it's incredibly important, right? That's the sacrifice that she made, right? To 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 bear to the world like her son and her own trauma in in order for the world to see w racial terror and trauma. And so that relationship, right? So she understood the, the, the significance of that because I think she understood that her son is, is representative of all of our, our children. Right, all of our black children, and so in in, in many accounts, right, of, you know, cite Emmett Till as that's when I just that's when I, I I confronted my blackness, or seeing Emmett was that could be me, right, and and so and so Mamie understood the power of that, 
right? And so when it's published in, in Jet Magazine, you know, for for everyone to see, that's a that's a that's a sacrifice, right? And so, you know, in her book, she she recounts like 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 seeing the body and 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 having to start from, you know, the feet up to 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 garner the 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 the, the will to, to look at her baby and and then to do that and then to put it on public display like is is a recognition that her child is everyone's black child and so it had a profound I think a profound impact um, on on the freedom movement and do did it did it obscure? No, I personally don't put that Mamie's decision. Like, did it obscure it? I think that the category of blackness always already obscures, right? Like, I think that that Emmett Till was as as marked as black obscured his boyhood, right? And so, you know, J.W. Millam and Roy Bryant um, um, you know, obscured him. But even then, right, like I'm 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 like I'm like kind of disappointed in like the direction of the conversation that that that, that where I'm going, right? Like I so I I kind of like I'm gonna be a little bit resistant to say more about it. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Um, I wanted to, uh, I was listening to the words that you chose, and I know mm -hmm. that writers choose words very intentionally. And sure. so I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the style of speech that you used from word tone, uh, sorry, word choice to like sentence structure tone anything else that you had on your mind when you were writing this um so in terms of, of tone i wanted to be as sort of like lighthearted and matter of fact as possible right like i'm talking about a child any child um but i also wanted to um use certain words that are associated with Emmett, but with the attempt to subvert any sort of like expectations around that, right? And so like, can we think about, so so for example, um, at Riverview, I wanted to, to, to talk a lot about the way that his like body moved in space and on a ride, because we don't talk about Emmett's body in the context of like experiencing the joys of a roller coaster or or the sort of like visceral experiences of 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 you know um, a dip or you know you know grabbing hold and holding tightly to something because you're having such a good time but you're also really scared right so so I think that like often when we think about Emmett, it's so fear is couched in in like the negative, but like how can actually it be the good kind of fear? Um, or um, when is when his body's being you know, or when his body is really being constricted and harmed, how does that actually mark a moment where it brings life and not death? so how he comes into the world right and so when i was talking about the harsh details if anybody knows the story and only knows the story for like a single reason you might think of something else rather than you might think of death rather than thinking about actually it's it's him actually coming to life right so like there, there were moments where like i would write intentionally but i was actually trying to unwrite and unlearn like 
my own associations, right? And so like, now I can think about Emmett in the context of a whistle and my, my mind goes to like, oh, maybe his first date, you know? And so, and that was, that was part of like the writing process for me, you know what I mean? And so like sometimes like the word choice was to help just like subvert my own expectations and to like rewire my mind and fully commit to, to, to his, to his joy. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Laura. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and so we'll maybe have one or two more questions. Um, Ben Harvey wonders if having gotten to know Emmett the way that you have through this joyous project, focusing on black joy. Um, can you imagine where Emmett might have fit into the world as an adult if he had been able to grow up? I mean, yeah, like I, he might be in Chicago just chilling. Like, right? Like, you know what I mean? He, he might be yeah, enjoying a hoagie. I don't know. You know, like, like, I, like, where would he be? Like, I like to think that, you know, he was with Simeon and he cried when Riverview, got, you know, was closed. And, you know, I, I, I could speculate like a lot of things, but I don't think it would be anything necessar necessarily exceptional, or maybe it would be. Uh, like it's, um, I just hope he was, he'd be having a good time. You know, like, like it's like the pot to me, like the possibilities are like literally endless about like what Emmett could be doing. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, so that, that, that's a really difficult question um, because my mind doesn't go to like, um, you know, for example, like, oh, what role would Emmett may have played in like the civil rights movement or something like that? You know, like that's not like necessarily what I'm interested in. And so, I don't know, he might be in the corner of Argo just chilling. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Do you have any last thoughts that you would like to add mm. or contextualize before we wrap up? Um, I really uh, appreciate uh, the coordinators for um, making space um, for me to do this project. Um, it, it, it has transformed me in doing it. And so I, I thank y'all for providing um, a, a space for that. Um, and I, I, I just hope that like, like that we can be a little bit more self-reflective about like, what work does our anticipation of Black Death do? And what does it um, make invisible to us? Or what do we deny us by only seeing us in terms of like our political significance to something? And so um, I was hoping that this project gave all of us an opportunity just to kind of like bask in joy for basking in joy's sake so thank you yes thank you so much i think everybody round of applause virtual or out loud whatever you prefer thanks y'all for showing up thank you all appreciate it um take care be well good night night y'all